September 24th, uh, His Holiness, Pope Francis, uh, will visit us here at the United States Capitol. That day, uh, His Holiness will be the first Pope in our history to address a joint session of Congress. Uh, we're humbled that the Holy Father has accepted our invitation and certainly look forward to receiving his message on behalf of the American people. Mr. President, final question. Yes, sir. You said famously, when you looked into Vladimir Putin's eyes, you saw his soul. Yeah. When you look into Benedict XVI's eyes, what do you see? God. Good way to end the interview. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. My pleasure. Sir. Thank you. Yeah. When you look into Benedict XVI's eyes, what do you see? God. happier note, a bit of good news. On September 24th, uh, His Holiness, Pope Francis, uh, will visit us here at the United States Capitol. Uh, that day, uh, His Holiness will be the first Pope in our history to address a joint session of Congress. We're humbled that the Holy Father has accepted our invitation and certainly look forward to receiving his message on behalf of the American people. We meet here at a moment of testing for Europe and the United States and for the international order that we have worked for generations to build. The end of these two wars affords us an opportunity that allows us to refocus our intelligence and military assets and resources to other parts of the world where they are needed where we face new challenges. This is the world you are graduating into. This is what I want to talk about today with you for a few minutes. I believe we, and particularly you, your class, has an incredible window of opportunity to lead in shaping a new world order for the 21st century in a way consistent with American interest and the common interest. Think of the possibilities. For the first time in history, the Western Hemisphere is in a position where it has the possibility of being middle class, democratic and secure from Canada to Chile. The Pacific Basin peaceful and prosperous, a new relationship with China where we cooperate and compete but where conflict is not inevitable, a revitalized global trading order, trading order defined by greater integration and economic growth where barriers are lowered at the borders and behind our borders, generating millions of American jobs. Where intellectual property is protected and the playing field is level. And where major powers come together to deal with the challenges of our time that require us all to act in concert. And there are many challenges, including violent extremism is becoming more diffuse. Countries emerging from chaos in the midst of war. Challenges the international order on the high seas and in the skies. Emerging threats in cyberspace. For the first time in world history, the use of corruption and oligarchs as a sinister tool in the conduct of foreign policy. That day, uh, His Holiness will be the first Pope in our history to address a joint session of Congress. For the first time in world history, the use of corruption and oligarchs as a sinister tool in the 
conduct of foreign policy. We're humbled that the Holy Father has accepted our invitation and certainly look forward to receiving his message on behalf of the American people. Countries emerging from chaos in the midst of war, challenges in the international order on the high seas and in the skies. The fall of Ramadi has galvanized the Iraqi government, so with the additional steps I ordered last month, we're speeding up training of ISIL forces, including volunteers from Sunni tribes in Anbar province. There were major powers who come together to deal with the challenges of our time that require us all to act in concert. And there are many challenges, including violent extremism, We did not claim or annex Iraq's territory. We did not grab its resources for our own gain. Instead, we ended our war and left Iraq to its people in a fully sovereign Iraqi state that can make decisions about its own future. For the first time in world history, the use of corruption and oligarchs as a sinister tool in the conduct of foreign policy. But order and progress can only come when individuals surrender their rights to an all-powerful sovereign. And a lot of our history comes from Rome. We have to recognize that. Uh, it was old uh, Gibbon who said that when the wars are fought, the victors tell the story. I'm not giving his words exactly, but that's the gist of what he says. Uh, he says, in other words, it is the victors who tell the story. So if you're a defeated Christian small group, then you are, your story is told from the standpoint of those who conquered you. And Pelican, the modern uh, American scholar, says, and there is no other way, many times, to tell the story. In the book of Revelation, they saw the picture of Rome's apostasy presented as an unfaithful woman sitting atop a seven-headed beast. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus.
the keys to theosophy. She lists three main goals of theosophy. Firstly, the universal brotherhood of humanity without distinction of race, color or creed. Secondly, to promote the study of the world's religions. And thirdly, to investigate the hidden mysteries of nature. Theosophy is the first major New Age group and they are largely responsible for many of the New Age beliefs, including the belief that Jesus represented the sun god. The global elite are New Age occultists who adhere to New Age dogma and are responsible for this trend of discrediting Christianity, Jesus Christ and Christian New World Order researchers. This trend is a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that is coming into fruition at the end of this age. The occult community is full of secret societies that practice secret oaths, secret meetings and secret occult practices. This implies that they have something to hide. The Bible says that what is done in secret will be brought into the light. God does not keep secrets, but has revealed truth to us in the Bible. At the heart of all occult teachings is pride, that their secrets are only for the select few. It caters for an elitist mindset. At the heart of all they teach and do is the attempt to discredit the true God, the deity of Jesus Christ, the Bible and Christians in general. Now in Ephesians 6 verse 12, the Bible reveals that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So we can see that uh, this is part of a spiritual battle. It's not people that we're fighting against. These ideas and ideologies and so-called spiritual principles come out of the demonic realm. These are spirit beings that are peering to these occultists and seeding their lies into their writings, into their minds, into their spirits. And of course, these doctrines of demons are then taught as so-called truths or spiritual revelation. Quote, it will be fought largely with mental weapons and in the world of thought. It will involve also the emotional realm from the standpoint of idealistic fanaticism. This inherent fanaticism will fight against the appearance of the coming world religion and the spread of esotericism. It must not be forgotten that only those souls who are on the probationary path or the path of discipleship will form the nucleus of the coming world religion. There is no question, therefore, that the work to be done in familiarizing the general public with the nature of the mysteries is of paramount importance at this time. When the Great One comes with his disciples and initiates, we shall have the restoration of the mysteries and their exoteric presentation as a consequence of the first initiation. Now from these doctrines we can see that the stated objective of these occultists is to indoctrinate the public with their esoteric religious ideas and to externalize their occult teachings in humanity with the ultimate realization of a new world order that is devoid of what they call the negative influences of traditional Christianity. By this they mean that Christians who claim that salvation can be found through Jesus Christ alone and only through Christianity and that the Bible is the source of absolute truth, these people, they say, are divisive, narrow-minded, bigoted, fundamentalist, idealistic fanatics who are hindering the spiritual evolution of humanity. In other words, Christians are holding back the planet and retarding human progress on the planet. Here is a quote by Zygmunt Brzezinski. He says, The tectonic era involves the gradual appearance of a more controlled society. Such a society will be dominated by an elite unrestrained by traditional values. Soon it will be possible to assert almost continuous surveillance over every citizen and maintain up-to-date complete files containing even the most personal information about the citizen. Horus is one of the oldest and most significant deities in ancient Egyptian religion. Horus served many functions in the Egyptian pantheon, most notably being the god of the sun, 
war and protection. He is known as the God of Vengeance, the God of the Sky, Protection and War. Now what many people don't realise is that America was founded by the Freemasons of Europe as a Masonic experiment. That's why, for example, uh, New York is named after the York Rites of Freemasonry in England, New York. And the Statue of Liberty, which was donated by the Freemasons of France to America, is in fact a statue that signifies spiritual evolution, where man becomes God through spiritual enlightenment. This is why you have like these rays of the sun around the head of this goddess Columbia, uh, which is standing with this flame or the light. This all signifies that Lucifer, the light bearer, brings enlightenment to humanity. The advance of industry and technology outpaced our ability to resolve our differences peacefully. Some are inherently superior to others, and we face difficult decisions about how to exercise our power. And in a world of challenges that are increasingly global, all of us have an interest in nations stepping forward to play their part. No amount of propaganda can make right something that the world knows is wrong. Leaders and dignitaries of the European Union, representatives of our NATO alliance, distinguished guests. We meet here at a moment of testing for Europe and the United States as an example of Western hypocrisy and for the international order that we have worked for generations to build. We meet in the hub of a union that brings together age-old adversaries in peace and cooperation. Understand as well, this is not another Cold War that we're entering into. That's why throughout this crisis, we will combine our substantial pressure on Russia with an open door for diplomacy. Moreover, Russia has pointed to America's decision to go into Iraq as an example of Western hypocrisy. We did not claim or annex Iraq's territory. We did not grab its resources for our own gain. Instead, we ended our war and left Iraq to its people in a fully sovereign Iraqi state that can make decisions about its own future. And we face difficult decisions about how to exercise our power. No amount of propaganda can make right something that the world knows is wrong. 